All right, guys. Uh, we are going to kick off this uh, afternoon sessions with a panel on lightning applications. Uh, we have Alexander Leishman from River, Taj from Lightning Spark, JHB from Lightning Labs, and our very own Willie as the moderator. So give it up for them. Hello guys, I'm super excited for this panel. Um, I, we have great, great set of speakers here and I'm far from an expert in the Lightning Network. So we wanna give as much time to the speakers as possible. So I'll just try to you know, moderate a few questions. Um, I think it would be best to start with a bit of introductions. I don't know how many of people are uh, familiar with the Lightning, Lightning Network. I, I know a lot of you guys probably are, but I wanna get everyone on the same page. So I think it would be best to, I guess, let's first start with a round of introductions for my guests. If yeah, we could start oh. with Taj. Hi, uh, I'm Taj Dreja. I sort of am somewhat responsible for some of this lightning stuff. Because, um, <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> well, it's like, obviously, way more people have done way more work on it than I did or Joseph did. And, you know, but, it's, but we wrote the initial paper and that sort of set off a lot of people working on it, which is really cool. Um, and so, yeah, that was back in, you know, 2015. Uh, Joseph Poon and myself wrote the Bitcoin Lightning Network. But even that was built on a lot of ideas about payment channels and, and networks and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's what I've been working on. Uh, you can, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm Alex Leishman. Uh, I run a business in the space called River, river.com. We're a Bitcoin brokerage uh, and financial institution serving consumers and businesses in the United States. We also run a lot of Lightning Network infrastructure. We've been running... Uh, supporting the Lightning Network uh, through our app since uh, 2019 when we launched. Um, uh, I've been in the Bitcoin space a while, um, but unlike Taj, I was just sitting around waiting for someone like Taj to invent the <laughs> Lightning Network. Uh, and then once he did, I was like, okay, finally, I can actually like work on stuff now that someone smarter than me has figured all this out. So, um, so yeah. Mm, Jonathan, or JHB, uh, I'm at Lightning Labs working on Taproot Assets, but that also runs on Lightning, sort of. So, um, I think a while ago did the like chain code lightning seminar. I was like, oh, this this payment channel stuff actually sounds like reasonable and probably not broken. And um, yeah, it's perfect. Fun network. All right, so now to get us all on the same page, I am going to start with the question, which is, what is the lightning network? And explain it to me like I'm five years old. Okay, so I, I I've I've done this a few times. So <laughs> the initial problem with Bitcoin is scalability, which we're still dealing with. And, you know, that was the first thing anyone ever said about it. It's like, this seems like a great idea, but it won't scale. Um, and because every transaction is broadcast to everyone. So like if you're running a Bitcoin node, you know, today you now have, I don't know, 20,000 more runes transactions on your <laughs> node and you're going to have to keep them forever. So the idea of Lightning Network is to try to get away from the broadcast model and uh, it builds on payment channel ideas where the idea is, okay, there's, you know, the Alice and Bob put some money together and can securely move the money between themselves without broadcasting to the network. And then once you have that channel set up where Alice and Bob can, you know, Alice knows that she has half and Bob has half, um, you can build a network of those channels and move payments around through that. Right. So I don't know if you guys want to. Yeah, one, one each, one each. Um, I, I, could, I could add an analogy to the normal f payment system that p people are used to. Um, making a Bitcoin transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain is kind of like sending a bank wire. Uh, it's, it's expensive, it's slow, it goes through the Federal Reserve. Um, and the Lightning Network is, is like Visa. Uh, it's sort of this out of band way of uh, sending promises to send money um, that then settle out behind the scenes through a, you know, through some settlement mechanism. Uh, and that, that's another way to just intuitively understand what the goal is. Nice. Okay. I don't know if I have further analogy or explanation right, right. to add. I mean, there's the, I guess for eCash, they mentioned the like carbon copy envelope where somebody else signs it. Um, and then that's like a valid note. But I think in the Lightning version, you could imagine like your bar tab or so of like, we're just going to condense this set of like yeah. updates of this TX from, you know, our funding transaction, our eventual close transaction. So if we were actually to write this out on paper and just like smush it together and call that the whole, um, 
channel state or like payment history. That's yeah. sort of what we're doing. Yeah, I don't know how much the five-year-old will know about <laughs> bar taps, but <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. This one is still intro, but it's uh, potentially an interesting one. So I've often heard this statement, and I quote, uh, that lightning is the only real L2. Um, is this like a misnomer or perhaps have some actual validity? What is a Bitcoin L2? Is there even a definition for it? Is it its own blockchain with its own security guarantees? Uh, so it's definitely not its own blockchain. Uh, and I don't know what L2, like I remember a while ago, like I think it was a digital garage. They're like, oh, there's, are, you know, you're doing an L2. And I'm like, wait, what's an L2? Because like yeah. when, we, when we started working on Lightning Network, it was just, I don't know, Lightning Network. There wasn't yeah. the idea of yeah. L2s really. Uh, and then I'm like, I, I guess it's an L2 if you want to call it that. Like, I don't know. And then there's a lot of, there's so many things that fall under that yeah. name. So I definitely wouldn't say it's the only real one, like, because it's such an expansive term. Um, but I will say, like, it's not the same security guarantee. Like, the goal is to have as close as possible to the same security guarantees as regular old Bitcoin on chain. It doesn't quite get there, right? There are definitely some risks. You know, if you have your money in a lightning channel, there are some risks that you wouldn't have if that money was in just a regular wallet. Um, you know, and there's this whole mechanism of like justice transactions, all that kind of stuff that you need to, you know, you, you do have a couple extra risks. But the benefit of having those risks is now you can make payments much more quickly and with lower fees. So it's definitely not, it's not like, oh, everyone should use it for everything. There's definitely a set of use cases where it's like, oh, it's, it's better for these things. Um, so the goal is like very close security, but I don't think there's ever, you know, it's never going to be the same. Um, and, and we find out, you know, it's, it is also more complex. Like we find out weird things. I don't know. <laughs> last year there was some like with LNV, you have to like, you know, monitor the mempool for pre pre images and stuff, you know, so there's always like little things and there's little things in Bitcoin too. Um, but it's the goal is sort of like spending money. Mm -hmm. And if you're like, I have a bazillion dollars worth of Bitcoin and I'm keeping it a vault, like, okay, don't use Lightning for that. Right. You know I think I would maybe add that it's the closest thing we have to a trustless L2, meaning that you don't have to rely on anyone else uh, to claim your funds back onto the main Bitcoin blockchain. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that there's lots of L2s. In fact, the most popular L2 is actually just what we call layer SQL, uh, mm -hmm. just like custodial. <laughs> Trans Bitcoin transactions um, oh, yes. off chain, uh, right? Just yeah. through an app, uh, um, and uh, and really, so in many ways, you could maybe put L2s on a spectrum from mm -hmm. sort of trustless to trusted. The you know trusted being something like like River or Cash App, where where you're sending it within the ecosystem, mm -hmm. and to trust the closest to trustless being being the Lightning Network. Yeah, I think usually the question, like this may be asking the question in a strange way of like, what does it mean to you if I say yes or no, it isn't, is or isn't an L2, like it's lightning, it works. And I mean, the um, only extra chain is like that channel DB file that you have on your machine that's like growing with all yeah. channel states, like that's the closest. Yeah. Okay, so maybe, yeah, you guys don't have to do this iterative order <laughs> thing, but um, so maybe to touch on Alex. Uh, so half a year ago, uh, River released a report um, titled Lightning Network grew by 1,212% in two years. What, is, what does that mean? Um, and is there anything else interesting from this report that you would like to highlight? Yeah, so, uh, so um, someone from our team, um, Sam, Sam Waters, uh, who, who leads uh, marketing and research at River, uh, has for the last few years been putting out a Lightning report um, uh, with statistics uh, and uh, insights that we see from our position in the Lightning Network. Um, one thing that might not be obvious to some people is that unlike a lot of other cryptocurrencies or the Bitcoin blockchain, the, the layer one, um, Lightning data isn't public. Um, mm -hmm. Everyone running a Lightning node has a little bit of a different view of the Lightning Network and sees and is routing different transactions. So to actually know what's going on in the Lightning Network, you kind of need some proprietary insights from mm -hmm. people operating nodes. So what we do is um, with our own data and then with the data of other large peers uh, in the Lightning Network, we synthesize that and try and put together insights and analytics. And so that, that growth number um, comes from the two year change between, uh, it was August 2021 and August yeah. 2023, mm -hmm. the number of transactions in 
uh, routed in that month that we estimated were routed in the Lightning Network based mm -hmm. on a certain methodology, really a lower bound estimate. Mm -hmm. um, and we estimated that in August 2023, the lower bound of Lightning transactions routed in the Lightning Network in August uh, was uh, around seven million transactions as a very yeah. as a very low bound, and then you know it's probably realistically much higher. Mm. Uh, and then two years before that, it was like a tenth of basically a tenth of that. Mm. Um, and so there was a lot of growth over those two years. Um, since then, there's been a lot of activity. Um, I'd say growth has slowed a little bit, but I think we're probably gearing up for another level with a lot of big exchanges adding it shortly. Mm -hmm. Cool, yeah, and this is, you kind of touched on another thing that I was gonna ask, um, is I think we're all familiar mainly with like Visa, MasterCard, and Visa processes 65,000 transactions per second. Um, and I know you talk about the, the brute number of transactions, but my question is, are we there yet in the transaction per second like um, metric? And is that even a metric that we really like care about in the I, I can say, like, thing? It's, if you just want to get 65,000 a second, you probably do that on Lightning Network today, but it would be like very artificial. It would be very much like, hey, we got it to do this because there are different scale of it. Like Lightning scales well to have payments per second, sure. Mm -hmm. But where it still runs into the same uh, limitations as, as regular Bitcoin is opening new channels, yeah. right? So if you say, okay, well, I want, you know, I want 8 billion people to all have a channel. Well, each channel is a UTXO yeah. and we have something like 100 something million UTXOs right now. That would be a huge change mm -hmm. uh, to Bitcoin and it's not really feasible. So you, you even, even with Lightning Network and the way Bitcoin works today, you can't really have everyone have their own Lightning channel. Um, I hope, you know, there's new, you know, there's new work to like hope that people can get there. Um, but it's more like the, re the restriction is how many people can you onboard. Mm -hmm. Once they're on board, you can do transactions very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's sort of, that's sort of the, the bottleneck. Whereas like, yeah, Visa can do 65,000 second. I'm sure the existing Lightning nodes can probably replicate that, but they wouldn't because like once you, you know, how, like if I have a Visa card, how often do I use it? Like, I don't know, once a day, yeah. maybe. So like in order to get 65,000, you need, I don't know, whatever the math a is, like billions of, <laughs> billions of people, right? Yeah. Because most people don't buy and sell stuff like every second. Yeah. Um, and so the reason you're, if you did have a nice, you know, global view of the Lightning Network, which fortunately nobody does, um, <laughs> you'd probably see there aren't that many transactions per second, even though like the ability is there, it's because there's not enough people on it. Yeah. Um, and that's still the sort of bottleneck of getting more people on board. And I think one other thing I would add is that um, it, it might not be obvious, but in the Lightning Network, how many transactions or how large of a transaction you can send is dependent on who you're sending to mm -hmm. and the path that transaction is taking, mm -hmm. which is very different than Visa. Yeah. So you have that sort of heterogeneity uh, that you don't have to deal with in the Visa world. Yeah. And I guess a follow-up question would be like, what is stifling this uh, mass adoption? Is it just too new of a technology or are there some technical or political challenges that are actually holding us back? Feel free. Yeah. You don't have to go in order. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, my own take on this is that the biggest hindrance, so um, Bitcoin just doesn't have product market fit yet as a medium of exchange. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it has very deep product market fit as a store of value. Something you buy, you hold, you preserve your wealth, you're, you know, you're holding this thing for the long term. Um, really though, the dollar is king when it comes to transacting. Uh, and making payments, uh, especially especially online, and that's really why we're seeing such a huge growth in Tether um, and just traditional fiat rails. And so the biggest sort of I think headwinds, you know, hindrance is um, is really at the sort of market level, which is like people just don't really have have a big need for Bitcoin for payments today, mm. um, and that's really the no kind problem. of big the macro main. theme. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think. <clears throat> Soon we'll have other techniques for putting other assets on the Lightning Network, yeah. and then yeah, I, we may I, capture I, some of that. I know, um, I know you're working on taproot assets. I think yes. maybe some of us would want a like an explanation of what is a taproot asset. What are you trying to do? Or are you trying to put rooms um, on? Or are you trying to put NFTs? No, the, are you trying to put stable coins. The, the extremely short version is some uh, protocol that actually scales for having assets that aren't Bitcoin represented in a UTXO. 
And if you can put it in the UTXO, you could maybe also put it in the Lightning Channel, and then you could eventually have, um, say, I have a channel at River that happens to have not just Bitcoin in it, but also some like USD stable coin, and I could get an invoice from Tej, and he wants euros, and I pay for my one hop in dollars, it gets routed in Bitcoin and pops out as euros on the other side. Uh, that would probably be very useful for a lot of people that right now are, I don't even know how you would use Tether, like which system Tether's running on, but um, yeah, there's a better payment or else for these other alt assets that like, people want to use. Right. So, cool. I can I can just say back like on, you know, what are sort of some bottlenecks? I like, I'm a technical person, so I'm like always identifying technical things. I'm like, let's fix that. So not Lightning, but I was working on UtreeXO, still do a little, and it's sort of like, oh, I want to make it easier for people to run nodes. And by easier, I mean, it'll take less hard drive space. And that's like a nice number. You can say, hey, it took gigabytes, now it only takes a couple megabytes, a thousand times better, so we'll have more people. But then if you actually like look at what people do, it's not usually hardware. It's you like that that can happen, but a lot of times it's like, I have no idea how this works. Yes. Right? Or like what does this do? And yes. and and especially with lightning, it's there's a lot of complexity where, you know, you're we're you know, at, at Lightspark we talk a lot to companies and I'm on calls a lot with companies. I'm like, man they don't know how Bitcoin works. How are they going to learn how Lightning works? Like, you know, there's just, it's, there's a lot of complexity. And some of that can be addressed through technical means. Some of that, we just need to make better UX. Some of it's hard because no one's in charge, right? So like there's kind of three competing address formats for Bitcoin or for Lightning, right? There's like Bolt 11, Bolt 12, and LNURL. And like, they all kind of, like the people working on it, well, Bolt 11 sort of dead, like old at this point, but like, they people kind of fight over it. Like that's just that's how like lightning. That's how Bitcoin works. Like no one's in charge. It kind of would be cool if I was, because like hey, but, but like no, no <laughs> one listens to me. If I'm like hey guys, don't do millisats, which I did say in you know Australia a bunch of years ago, and they're like nah, we already have yeah, it in the code. Yeah. We're not changing yeah. it. I'm like ah, oh. so so it's just everyone does whatever they want, right? There's no official anything. Same as Bitcoin, and that is hard to make a really usable. You know, Clean like easy thing. to use, nice. Yeah. You know, it's the opposite of like Apple. Yeah, I, I hear Apple. even like yeah. Coinbase couldn't even if we if Coinbase can't run their own <laughs> node, how do we expect that? Yeah, so so part of it, you know, <laughs> have have companies helping, have you know, work through this. Um, but also, it's probably going to be like this way for a while because of the no one's in charge aspect. I see. Right. So like, if you say, oh, we're all going to use LNURL for everything, mm -hmm. like, I mean, LND is not going to support. On URL nav natively, I imagine, because I don't think. I think there's know. probably some community add-on. Yeah, you need an add-on add or something, and so there's yeah. definitely parts where, like, we don't. You know, it's not like everyone agrees on how to move forward with it, with this, mm -hmm. and so you're gonna have. You know, it's good. You have a diversity of opinions, <laughs> all these different things, but it's also like kind of less efficient because it's like harder to deal with. So that that can slow things down, but I think ultimately, like, that's just how that's how Bitcoin and Lightning work. I mean, I think it's what is it? It's like the seven layer, like OC, like IP cake of like. They had to write the paper a while ago. Then we needed a soft fork to like get some opcodes activated. Mm -hmm. People had to start writing implementations. Like things just take a while. Take time, yeah. So like the paper had to exist before the code. Now the code exists. We need some companies or other entities that are shipping more code with more tools to like help some business that doesn't want to deal with running a node and like managing liquidity or something to like actually make that easy so they can go do what they intended to do yeah. and accept payment on Lightning. So like time. Perfect. <laughs> What kind of politics? And I guess maybe we should talk about technology also. Is there, what are the current technological limitations holding the community back for scaling? Or do you think it's all just trying to get everyone on the same page? I mean, I would say that I think one of the, there's really two big challenges with Lightning. Um, one being that for the non custodial, uh, consumer, right? So yeah. the consumer who wants, who's used to sort of holding their keys, having a wallet on their phone, um, you know, there's lots of popular apps now that mm -hmm. let, you to, let you to hold your own keys. Trying to fit Lightning into that model is very tricky because the way Lightning, the Lightning network works is you need a, you need a channel mm -hmm. with every peer, uh, with everyone you, you want to be able to pay. Yeah. And this channel is this requires an on-chain transaction to open and, um, you ha you're like locking up capital in this thing. And yeah. so you imagine if you have a bunch of users of a wallet that want to have a non-custodial <laughs> lightning wallet, you need to open channels with them so that they can receive money. But you're, if, you're the, if you're sort of like the node operator, you're yeah. locking up your own Bitcoin in these channels. And yeah. so the economics of this come into question. Yeah. And so it, that, like, that's a big hindrance. The yeah. economics of it is a very big hindrance to self-custody 
for the consumer. So then it comes into, okay, well, the Lightning experience is actually pretty good for custodial apps. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and it's sort of making all the custodial apps intercompatible for sending just Bitcoin payments. Mm-hmm. Now, but running Lightning nodes at scale is very different than just running a Bitcoin node because a Bitcoin node, like we said, it's just all the same. Like, you know, just loading the blockchain, one, one block every 10 minutes, like whatever. Um, running a Lightning node, it's a stateful operation. It's sort of like you're, you're managing channels. There's like funds hot. There's edge cases. Mm-hmm. Auditing it gets more challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, explaining it to accounting and all this stuff. So uh, these are very these are very surmountable challenges. Um, I think LightSpark is doing a good job, and, and now LND making these things a lot easier for people. Um, but those are just some of the things that come to mind. I think on the technical side, also um, PTLCs are like a nice development that should unlock a bunch of other features. Uh, but that depends on like other implementations actually. Um, implementing simple tapper channels. So there's like, again, another few steps in like a bunch of cat herding to... I'm sorry, you're gonna need to define me. PTLC is a different than a... a point time lock PTLC. contract. Yeah, so so okay. it's current in, in the lightning lingo, when you're sending someone a payment, you'll hear HTLC, HTLC. and that's hash time lock contract. Yep. Um, and that's sort of how payments move around. And the next version or sort of upgraded version is called a point time lock contract, which is more powerful and better it's got better privacy Mm -hmm. but it's also like significantly more complex um and so it's it's going to take a while for everyone to start you know all the different implementations to to get up to using ptlcs there's a lot there's a bunch of like uh val just gave a talk right before launch i think uh about offline receive and how that's a you know real pain Mm -hmm. point of if you're you know if you want to receive money from someone but you're offline and you know how to manage that so there's a lot of um a lot of improvements happening, mm-hmm. but they're all sort of, you know, fixing little parts. And so it's, you know, it's going to take a while yeah. to like, get. it's sort of like, you know, the World Wide Web, where if you like started in like 95, like, yeah, you have a web browser, but it's like lots of different features <laughs> start getting at it. It's not, you know, no one's in charge of it all. And so like eventually you get uh, really Something useful stuff. Though. Yeah. Okay. I don't want to hog our panel of experts um, to myself. So if the audience has questions, Wow, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, any, sure, let's go. Okay, sure. Hi, I'm Natasha. I uh, work with Jack and Developer. So, my question to you can be going to talk about Lightning Network privacy fees. Who pays what? Uh, how much is right now? What is the kind of information on the web, too? Um, as well as what are the technical requirements to have your own Lightning Network? Okay, fees. Yeah, fees, yeah. fees can yeah. be complex. Most, so, there's two types of fees, right? There's the fees that everyone knows about in Bitcoin, which is like minor fees, transaction fees. And so those do exist in Lightning to open and close channels, right? So if you're generally, the way it works right now is if you're opening a channel, you pay the fee. Um, and you pay the fee to close it. So the person who creates the channel pays to establish and to close out the channel. Um, and so that's generally okay. And it's sort of the way people think about fees, but it can be a little tricky. And then there's uh, routing fees where if you're making a payment within the Lightning Network, you will still pay fees to this, these intermediate nodes. That's, in theory, more complex, but actually ends up being a lot easier because they're, those fees are very low. Those fees don't really go up the way fees... Like, so if you've used Bitcoin in the last day or two, the fees were enormous, right? And so if you're like, oh, I want to open a Lightning channel, you know, yesterday, it's like, well, it's going to cost, I don't know, 50 bucks or something ridiculous. Um, I think today it's down to like 10 bucks, so, and hopefully tomorrow it'll be like five bucks. Um, and so though, you know, those transactions to open and close channels are you know, subject to the whims of the mempool. But once you have a you know, channel open, you pay very small fees that are a percentage of how much you're sending. And those are much more stable and sort of easy to deal with. Is yeah, like that. Yeah, generally it's, I mean, it depends on the nodes in the middle, but yeah, generally it's a small percentage. Who does the, yeah, who decides the... The percentages that's the, the, the nodes in the middle. I don't know what's like a standard. So if you yeah. yeah if you're running so if you're running a node, um, you're basically saying that you know people can route payments through me, and you can s- decide what you want that fee oh, to be for routing that payment. And so the fee that your payment pays depends on how many hops that your payment yeah. takes, and what the fees each node uh, along the way charges mm-hmm. to route a payment. And so. The order of magnitude it can range anywhere from, um, you know, zero point zero five percent up to half a percent. 
Uh, some node operators are dynamically adjusting things depending okay. on sort of like the supply and demand and the direction of the payments. Mm -hmm. so, I would so, say gen like in the last year, it's generally way smaller than on-chain, right? Like, yes, yeah. but it also depends so. on the amount. So, <laughs> so. an on-chain on payment fee is based on the amount of data in the transaction, not mm -hmm. the amount of money. Whereas a Lightning Network fee is based on the amount of money being sent. So for smaller transactions, the Lightning Network is almost always better. Mm -hmm. But for very large transactions, like many millions of dollars, that's something well, you would still do. It just won't work. It's just, right? yeah. <laughs> that's something you would do on the Bitcoin blockchain block, yeah. directly. Perfect. Um, we had some in the, I think the back. I'll, 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 oh, just a computer? computer? <laughs> like any computer made in the last 10, 15 years will be able to. If, if the audience doesn't mind, um, it's hard to hear on the live if you don't go to the microphones. If you don't mind going to the microphone, that would be great. Um, thank you. And we could have a line and then it'll make things easier. All right, perfect. Thanks. I just want to make like a follow up if I understand it like fully and correctly. I want to make sure that if I'm going to use the Lightning Network and to send someone or a relative to send in either Latin America or somewhere, that is, is still um, less expensive. If I use Lightning Network, rather than use the current Western Union or some other payments today, is my understanding correct that it's still going to be less if I use a Lightning Network? In terms of the fee, because it doesn't make sense, right? If I am an ordinary person and I want to send money somewhere, if it's more expensive to, to use it, right? The, the short that. answer is it's almost certainly cheaper than Western Union, but the, the, big, the bigger question is, is the recipient going to have access to a Lightning sort of payment? Is, is, are they going to be able to receive it? And so I think that would probably be the, the bigger challenge today is, you know, if someone, you know, do they have an app that has this functionality built in? And if the answer is yes, then it's probably going to be much cheaper than Western Union. Yeah, I think... There have been, like, over the last year or two, more companies popping up that, I don't know, I feel like it's the old, like, Bitcoin talk is, like, Bitcoin's for remittances. And it's, like, on-chain Bitcoin's not for remittances. It's like, Lightning could be for remittances or something like that. Um, and I think it's still, like, based on what I've seen of what those companies are doing, uh, yes, it should be cheaper, but it depends on how many times you're swapping currency pairs and, like, you're still going to pay a fee there. So it could end up being a wash yeah if you, you know the it. actual lightning part definitely cheaper but if it's end-to-end -end, like i have a 20 dollar bill i want you know whatever 100 pesos in mexico city that might be more expensive because you know there's there's parts that the lightning network itself can't deal with like you know how do you get the dollars into sats how do you get the sats into yes you, okay <laughs> yes. yeah so that those might be hard Maybe. Well, yeah. it's, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one, one. Sure, yeah. Okay. Thank you. We'll see if it bounces. So, uh, I have a question about uh, cross-chain. So, in my knowledge, the Lightning protocol could be used to build the cross-chain applications. Uh, I want to, uh, you give us a uh, 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 status of current uh, situation of the cross-chain by using the Lightning Network and what's the future of that kind of application? Um, no, me, like, sure. I mean, <laughs> I don't know the full history here, but yes, I think you could, um, yeah, get Lightning as is to work on like Litecoin and some other very Bitcoin-like systems. I think the cross-chain version is just having like an HDLC on another chain. I right? can say a little, like, the functionality is there and theoret not just theoretically, like yeah, LND runs on Litecoin and, and that was a sort of big idea when we first